Good morning and welcome to this City Talk webinar. This it will uh, is the third in a series of events featuring the findings from our Nord Green project on smart planning for healthy and green Nordic cities. A special thank you to all of you who are joining us for this third and final time. I'm Annika Estman. I'm the head of communications here at Nordregio, and I will be moderating today's event together with my colleague Luciana. Uh, the title of today's webinar is How Can Green Space Improve Health? Stavanger in explores new design methods. Over the next hour, we'll hear presentations from our partners in the projects and we'll also have a panel discussions. But really importantly, we also want to hear from you. So please make sure to use the chat function to provide comments and questions and we'll get to them at the end of the discussion. Now, uh, we're also going to share the recording and the presentations after the event. But now I'm going to hand over to Luciana, who'll say a few more words about the Nord Green project. Thank you, Anika. Yes, hello. I am Luciana Iguar Borges, a senior research fellow at Nord Regio and project manager of Nord Green, which is funded by Nord Forsk. Nord Green develops solutions for well designed, high quality green space that promote equity, health, and well being. We use an innovative research approach uh, that investigates like the health uh, green space nexus with assistance from the epidemiological research, environmental psychology, co-creation and governance. And to do this, we have a consortium with participation of four research institutions and six Nordic cities. And today we have here with us like our partners from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science and Stavanger Municipality. They will share uh, their experiences and discuss how can the design of green spaces improve the health and, and well-being of people. So our first speaker today is Anna Bengtsson. Anna is a landscape architect and senior lecturer at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. She researches and teaches about health promoting outdoor environments, evidence-based design and environmental psychology. And after Anna, we'll hear from Elsie Dipke. Elsie is a landscape architect, project manager, and department leader in Stavanger Municipality. She takes a human-centered and holistic approach in her work, which involves the planning and design of diverse types of like outdoor environments. And finally, we're going to hear from Martina Andersson, who is also a landscape architect and project manager in Stavanger Municipality. She works with both city planning as well as more detailed landscape design. Uh, Martina is especially interested in implementing natural processes, research and art into the design process. So with that, let me now hand over to you, Anna Bengtsson. Thank you. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Now give me a second to... Okay, so the question we asked was, how can green space improve health? And uh, to answer that question in this project, we need to work together, researchers and practitioners, to explore new design methods, or as we, we call them here, evidence-based design methods. Uh, could you help me to, to share to the next picture? Thank you. So in this project, we have used the term evidence-based practice, meaning that practitioners like green space planners, designers and managers are equipped with evidence concerning green space and health in their work. So first, it's about the more basic evidence that there are many health benefits connected to using green areas and living close to green areas. We know that green areas in our everyday environments are really important for health and well-being. And today we also know quite a bit about more specific environmental qualities and zones that support and inspire people to use the outdoors. And we know about different needs and preferences of different user groups like children, older people and people with special needs. But of course, also people's general needs in contact with the outdoors. So to make the research about health and well-being in connection to green space more 
comprehensible and useful for practice. We are developing these evidence-based models and methods for health promoting outdoor environment. And to do this, we need to work together, of course, practitioners and researchers. And the overall goal, goal is, of course, to develop health promoting outdoor environments. Next slide, please. So we have been working together to develop evidence-based models and methods for health promoting outdoor environments in three projects in Stavanger. It's B Parken, that's a renovation and a new design of a central park. And then we have Sankt Svitund Ungdomsskola. It's about the renovation and new design of a schoolyard for kids aged 13 to 16. And finally, we have Esotomta, and that's an industrial area redesigned into a recreation area. Next slide. So we were working with three evidence-based models. And the first one is four zones of contact with the outdoors. And this uh, model identifies four zones in which help promote an interaction with the outdoor environment can take place. The first zone, zone one, is from inside a building through windows. Zone two is from inside transition zones, for instance, balconies or terraces, patios. And then we have zone three, and that's a garden or a park. And finally, zone four, and that's the surrounding environment outside this park. We also actually have, as you can see in the model, zone zero, and that corresponds to areas inside buildings without contact with the outdoors, no windows and no health effects of contact. And the model makes aware, for instance, that if you design a pocket park in a city, which would be a zone free space, then natural elements, vegetation and water could have an impact not only on the people using the park, but also people who see the pocket park from their window, zone one, uh, from their balcony, which is zone two, or just passing by on the street, walking to, to work in the morning, for instance, and that would be from zone four. Next slide. And then we have the second evidence-based model that we used, and that's the triangle of supportive environment. And the shape of this model, the triangle, illustrates that the more vulnerable a person is, the greater the possible positive impact of the physical environment, but at the same time also the need of a supporting environment. So this model also describes a gradient of challenge from bottom to the top, where the base of the triangle describes preferences and needs of those who are really sensitive to overstimulation. For example, mentally vulnerable persons, people experiencing stress, people that need to be on their own and seek more calm and undemanding impressions in natural environment. And then the top of the triangle describes those who need outward directed in involvement and seek environments with many people, lots of things happening, activities going on, and so on. Next slide. However, this, the shape of the triangle would actually be inverted in terms of target groups that are instead sensitive to understimulating environments. For example, people in need of more social interact, interaction and uh, people seeking more stimulating qualities in the environment at the top of the gradient. So the third and final model is the quality evaluation tool and it describes 19 evidence-based environmental qualities, which are divided in two groups. First, we have qualities for people to be comfortable to use outdoor environments, the comfortable design. And this needs to be considered as much as possible all over a project site to help as many people as possible to be able to use, use it, use the site. And then, of course, we have the qualities for people to experience stimulation and then the positive contact with outdoor environments. And this is about stimulating design. And here we follow the overarching pr principles of the gradient of challenge and the supporting the triangle of supportive environments that you sh I showed you just before, with the more calm and undemanding impressions in natural environments at the bottom of the gradient and the more social and active environments at the top of the gradient. Next slide. Uh, the quality evaluation tool also de describes an overall working process for practitioners to follow to apply these evidence-based models. 
And phase one is about identifying existing zones and help promoting environmental qualities from the models. Uh, phase two is about identifying user perspectives and connect them to the models. Uh, phase three is about designing and developing green spaces with an awareness of the models. And then finally, you can also use the models if you conduct a post occupancy evaluation. And finally, I think it's important to mention that this research, these models, they are not about replacing something. It's actually about adding aspects and hands-on awareness concerning people's health and well-being. It's more like being equipped with knowledge concerning health and well-being. So there is not one right solution or even one process and even if the same models are used, and even if you go through all these phases, the result is always unique to, to the site and, and to the context, which will now be exemplified by Elsa and Martina in Stavanger. So now I hand over to you, Elsa. Thank you so much. I'll see if this works shifting. Since 2008, uh, some of our investment areas in the municipality has been about renovating schoolyards. We have 42 public schools and we renovate three each year. And mainly so far, the main focus has been on uh, activity. Next in line, when we started joining North Green was uh, St. Svitun School. It's in the city center. And it was a perfect match because many of our schoolyards are uh, too small compared to national guidelines, the outdoor areas. As you see here, some facts about the school. It's a more than 100 years old. It's a secondary school. And the area per student is only 8.5 compared to recommended 30 square meters per student. It was also interesting that it's uh, in the Storhaug district in the east of the municipality. And that district has the least amount of green space per inhabitant as well as, unfortunately, scored the worst result in our living conditions survey. Not Green, Smart Planning for Healthy and Green Nordic Cities. Um, to use this evidence-based design has been a supplement to our landscape uh, architect approach to the project development that we have. In this presentation, I will try to describe how we have used the four zones as well as user participation. As a landscape architect, we always uh, begin our uh, approach, um, our projects with a um, site visit, and uh, also a site analyze. Uh, as we see here on the left, it's interesting and very important in this case to see the distance between the schoolyard and the green surrounding um, nearby in the city, as well as public meeting places, especially since it's a gray and a uh, very small schoolyard. The fourth zone, that's a new approach for us, a new method to use. It was interesting to have the dialogue with Anna and Anna. And we have tried to use it um, as good as possible. We, um, as you see on the map or the drawing, uh, there's quite many uh, indoors areas, zone one, that you see out and connect with the outdoor area. Uh, the four zones are important. Have we learned uh, when we are assessing transition zones and also to see which qualities lies in the different zones. There's no conclusion to what size the each zone should be. As mentioned, it's a green, um, no, it's a gray schoolyard, I'm sorry, but the surroundings are a little bit green. This uh, analytical um, picture hopefully corresponds with the zones diagram. As you see on the left, there's a churchyard nearby, and that's give, that gives the area a more green um, outdoor uh, feeling. The picture's a little bit misunderstanding or misleading because it's taken in the early springs. User participation is a method that we already are using our, in our project development. Here, the user group was quite easy to identify. It's the students as well as the teachers, if we, we want them to use the outdoor areas for education. The yellow uh, notes have been put on by the students, both positive and negative 
um, experience of their schoolyard today. The quote, as you see, I hope it will be more interesting and not so flat as and boring as now. And also the most important thing is that social meeting places are set up. That quote is very important and it um, builds up under a North Green um, research founding. With all these and a lot of more uh, background, uh, we have a conclusion that um, we need to extend the areas, the students of the outdoor areas. And we have therefore suggested to include some of the nearby surroundings. Um, today, parking is in zone one. We include that one. We include some of the streets, number two, and also some public properties nearby, number three. With this, we increase from 8.5 to 15 square meters. 15 is still only half of what is recommended. Hopefully with our design and um, we hope that we have um, will challenge or um, give the students this uh, better green outdoor areas that they uh, need. Still, we need to establish some more positive measures and we hope with a greater spaciousness inside um, this schoolyard and with some blue green solutions as well as stormwater management, we will give it a more identi identity. We will reduce noise and pollution, hopefully, and make a better climate. We ha have also um, worked with taking the ball area into the uh, streets so that there will be a more attractive local environmental facilities in the free time. Here you see the before and after zone map. <clears throat> uh, zone one and two are, so to speak, the same size, but we give it a more, um, more green content and hopefully therefore well-being. Um, zone three have been increased as we just talked about the extension and some more spaciousness. And so on four also shows that we use more of the nearby streets as part of the schoolyard. So all in all, the big question have we learned and what have we learned? We have learned to use the four zones method. It's a uh, Um and we can also use it to argument why we make choices and recommendations. It has been, in this case, easier, uh, understand me correctly, to use because we have a building as a starting point, a single building. Um, user participation is a necessity and depending on the project, it differs on when to implement it and how. And we see that the result can be influenced on uh, when you do, uh, what, when you use it and uh, uh, how you use it. Here it has been interesting to see that the politicians have used our health um, results as an argument for promoting from cars to green and changing the parking areas to a schoolyard. We have learned as lab architects, uh, Martina and I and our colleague, um, to use new methods and to learn more about the connection between health and outdoor areas. So far, we have to see if it works. Uh, the schoolyard will be built next year, physically, this inner schoolyard, and over the next following years, we'll do the streets as well. So we um, will come back to you to see if uh, this more green schoolyard have the health aspect and well-being that we are hoping for. And with that, I would like to give the word to Martina, my colleague. Hello. Thank you, Anna, Elsa, Suzanne, and um, uh, Annika. Yeah. So um, um, my name is Martina. And I will tell you about uh, our next Norgreen case, which is called Hamnevika. Um, let's see. Hamnevika Recreational Area. Uh, we called it Esotomta before because it's privately owned, but we are planning to to buy this property and transform it to a public park. So we gave it a more public name. Um, this case is very different from the schoolyard because it doesn't include like a public building like Elsa mentioned. Um, this is a future seafront park and it's located in a district called Hilleborg. 
The picture shows what the area looked 10 years ago. So the area around the future park scores generally low in livability service, which is why we have an ongoing cross-sectorial investment to raise the liv livability standards. One of the measures is to transform gray into green and to respond a high, to a high demand for nature, meeting spots and the clean water environment. So health is a big issue when working with this area, which is why we thought it was very valuable to talk about solutions together with Anna and Anna. So the seafront of Hildevog has been hidden away behind fenced industry for many decades. It has appeared that some of the young people in Hildevog doesn't even know that they live close to the sea. This former tank plant has unfortunately left a rather polluted and destroyed nature behind. However, the area is being sanitized step by step and the goal is a to a naturally restored area with possibilities to even swim in the ocean. The area is still partly privately owned and the fences were taken down just a few years ago. However, uh, we can see that the area has been taken into daily use, even though it's not officially opened as a park yet. Paths are indicating that fishermen, swimmers and other user groups are in this area every day, and the need to create a safe and clean environment is urgent. The municipality wants to make this area accessible for a wide range of users and open up for public water sports, which means major investments in upgrading both the sewage system and or improve the blue green structures in general in Hilleborg. So technical issues present enormous costs. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we need good evidence that can point out the long-term health effects and how society can gain in the long run. So when applying Nordgreen to Hamnevika, we use the evidence-based design theories that Anna mentioned earlier. We analyzed the 19 environmental qualities and collected and categorized citizens' input and made a project suggesting uh, using knowledge from the triangle of supporting environments. The four zones model was used, how, however, less than in the school project, since this area doesn't have buildings, like we mentioned. So we studied the area in terms of how comfortable it is. We asked questions like, how is the area in terms of accessibility and orientation? Do one feel safe here? Are there facilities to support basic needs, such as toilet or shelter in bad weather? Is the area accessible the whole year regarding the windy, dark and somehow rainy climate in Stavanger? So we analyzed this through site visits, documentation, interviews and studying people's behavior and also interviewing people. We also studied the qualities regarding if the area is stimulating or meaningful. We asked questions like, what can people experience here? Are there elements of cultural importance or a special sense of landscape? Can we enjoy nature's diversity or relax in a beautiful surrounding? Can we hear and see nature, life and other people? Can we hide away in case we need restitution? So these, all these 19 themes were documented and described both with text, images, and maps. Um, so asking questions like, what meaning do we find spending time in this area may lead to very personal answers and is not evident in terms of how we document or visualize the results. The researchers were supportive when letting us testing out mapping methods and encouraging us that there are many options in how to visualize this. The next part of the tool was to collect information about the users. Different user groups must be included in the design, both physically and in terms of the activities spread out during the whole year or rhythm of the day. 
input to Hamnevika was categorized to approach the Nord Green knowledge from our project's perspective. One important physical example is how the industrial remains are linked to an essential part of the experience of the site. These are mentioned again and again. The constructions are in today's shape neither safe nor easy to restore. However, we can see how important they are uh, for the landscape character and its cultural connection to the past. These constructions appear to be both exciting, calming and a bit challenging, uh, but also an important plus form for the fishermen. The experience is special here, and that is something we want to grasp in order to give this area a unique and special nature or identity. The concepts and suggested map that follow the analyze directs the design towards a park where green and blue nature meets activities or, uh, of different character. The areas are somewhat glued together, reusing industrial remains or aesthetics that we want to be shown in the final design when that comes. Um, it can take quite many years, though. So um, the first sketch that we uh, this year used to get the project approved by the politicians it tests if the theories at this early project stage may have an impact in how the area will be regulated and de developed in the future. So far, the enthusiasm has been quite large and the politicians have decided that we shall continue with this project. By cleaning the area, restoring its nature and making it green and accessible, we believe that it can have a positive health effect for a wide range of users. Um, where there's space for both inwards involvement and outwards involvement. And like Elsa said, we have learned uh, quite much, very much actually. And uh, so I think for us landscape architects, we have improved our ability to include health issues in the design process, but also to uh, communicate with um, our colleagues in the health department, for example, we know more about the issues that we have to approach in the physical environment. Um, a design process, however, is very complex. And when adding research and theories to a project, one must be aware of the whole process and see the tool as an important complement. So to take an extra loop in the design process, reading up on nature's effect on health, taking time to add immaterial qualities and give meaning to a project is also healthy for us as designers. So thank you. Thank you, Anna, Martina and Elsa for your presentations. We are now gonna turn to the discussion and we are gonna ask a fourth participant to join us. Um, this is Anna Åshage, uh, who's a research assistant in environmental psychology at the Swedish University of Life Sciences. And in the Norgreen project, Anna has worked closely um, with the project leaders in Stavanger and followed their use of the research-based tools in three development areas. Um, but to kick off the questions, I'm actually gonna turn to you, Anna Bengtsson, and um, <clears throat> The models you presented uh, provide this systematic approach to the design of both public and semi-public spaces uh, with really a focus on health and the well-being of its users. So could you maybe share with us how this research even came about? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation before, this is an, a really an extensive field of research from varying disciplines and which has been developed since the 80s in Sweden and internationally uh, and it's getting more and more attention today which is really good I think um, however to to it takes a lot of time to read all this research and to translate it into knowledge that you can actually use in practice mm. uh, so that's the intention of our research and of this project to to make this extensive research and knowledge about health promoting outdoor environments accessible and also useful for practitioners. Great, thank you. 
Okay, so I would like to welcome Anna Oshage to the discussion and I have a question to you because I know that you have implemented and evaluated like the use of evidence-based design principles like in city planning and also like in landscape design for many years and also like in many different contexts. Besides the work that you have carried out together with uh, Stavanger, you also work like with Tebi Municipality, for example. So my question is like uh, based on your experience, in what way people will be healthier in environments that are designed with the assistance of evidence-based mo models? Thank you. Yes, that is really an important question. Uh, city planners and landscape architects designing public places have a huge responsibility for creating sustainable and healthy urban living environments. And as we had a lot of research from the past decades conclude that the green environments have positive impact on human health and well-being in various ways. Uh, and many city planners and landscape architects that I have talked to recognize this and want to integrate the health perspective into city planning. But they question what this means on a practical design level uh, and want to know how they can know for sure that the design solution they suggest really will support and promote health for the residents. Um, and as we heard earlier, evidence-based design is not about uh, any standard design solution that you can copy and paste. Uh, so it's rather about the landscape architect's ability to apply research-based knowledge in a local context and understand user specific needs and site specific challenges from a health perspective. And uh, to my experience, using this kind of evidence based design tools can help the landscape architect to make well informed design decisions from a human health perspective. And it helps them to be aware of what kind of aspects are important to consider in, in the design process and help to create awareness of how different types of qualities can promote or hinder health promoting experience for different users. Mm -hmm. And um, this tool guide the landscape architect through the process and, and help to identify existing health promoting qualities in the development site that are important to safeguard in future development. Uh, and it supports uh, an understanding of different user needs. And it also identifies and selects what qualities are most important to develop in each specific context based on different users' need. Uh, so a, a key is to use the information gained from following this process to make well-informed design decisions that you also are able to motivate based on research knowledge. And an important last step is, of course, to, to follow up on the outcome of the design, for example, by making cost evaluations or <clears throat> by following up on public health statistics uh, uh, to find out if the design worked as planned. Uh, and it could be um, useful, for instance, to have health statistics on neighborhood level that can adapt the survey questions to catch the relationship between human health and access to different green qualities. And uh, for example, as suggested in by the research group in the first of these city talks. Okay. Thank you so much, Anna. Very interesting uh, reflections. I will turn to Martina now. And then we understood like that the first evidence-based model was developed by looking at how green space affects different kinds of people and that they have like also obviously like different uh, needs. So uh, my question is about like, what does this look like when you apply the models in Stavanger and how do the models help like to serve like different social groups? What's your experience on that? Hi, again. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, we understood that the first time the researchers tested this tool, it was focusing more on specific groups with specific conditions. Uh, but in Nordgreen, we tried to scale up these ideas to a more general state of the people in the area that we work with. Um, and we work with long term solutions for people with various kinds of needs. Um, so what we experienced was that every project that we work with needs to integrate these methods in a sort of area and people specific way to, so to say. 
And the results are depending on what information we have about the people that will use the park or the green area. And uh, in our design process, we can use different tools to get this information. So we have overarching service covering some of the health data, uh, but we also need to ask the people what, what their experiences are uh, in an area. Uh, what the needs are, and um, we must not forget uh, the groups that are not uh, really raising their voices uh, on themselves, like, for example, the fishermen in the area mm -hmm. uh, that actually use time every day in Hamnevika. Uh, it was very interesting to talk to them and hear what they experienced. Um, yeah, so I think that was my answer. <laughs> I think uh, what's been clear here today and also in our other webinars is that the Nord Green project is really good about uh, encouraging this interaction between researchers and practitioners. And um, I think in a way you can say that uh, the researchers sort of adopt the agenda of municipality. It's, it's not an add on or extra work for municipalities. And so going back to you in, in Stavanger, Elsa, I wanted to ask you, how long have you all been working on incorporating health into planning practices and, and, and why did you even start? In general, the municipality plans and develops uh, in different levels. Um, and we have a public health strategy uh, it's another department uh, responsible for that one. Uh, as mentioned, we carry out living condition surveys to be able to know our inhabitants and how the living are. We have had since 1965 a green plan. So there has been a focus on getting people out to the green areas and hopefully um, giving them a health, better health. Um, in our project development in our department, it's, um, it's, by joining North Green, we got a tool for implementing health in the design. I think we have almost always um, focused on the user's well-being, but mainly uh, as a landscape architect and not from the researcher's point of view. Um, and I think we will just keep on working with it. It's very interesting and it's a good we have a good argument, even better argument than just making good outdoor areas, why it's easy or why it's necessary necessity to um, make it green and nice. And picking up on that, Martina, you are also a landscape architect. And how would you say using these evidence-based design models differs uh, from when you do other planning? Well, um, yeah, like Elsa also mentioned, we. We always like think about these things in the in the uh, design process, uh, and we all always start by analyzing the site. And user participation is required in more or less all of our projects. However, I think this evidence-based design models and exchanging ideas with the researchers, uh, not least, uh, added a very important health-oriented layer. Uh, it's inspired to a new way of seeing and categorizing landscape qualities and maybe also spending more time in the analytical phase. Because mm. uh, when we, in our daily work, we, uh, we often become a bit impatient. Uh, we want to finish the design as quickly as possible to get it built. And uh, when we extend the analytical uh, phase, it's less probable that we forget something important. Uh, we really try to understand the people, um, what they experience in the area, and we take a step away from the more technical or material issues that is often quite urgent and um, takes up a lot of our capacity. Um, so uh, I think uh, it, it was very a good lesson for us to to work with the researchers Anna and Anna and uh, practicing shifting point of view, uh, like stepping out of our designer shoes and um, start with the theories and uh, the tool and discuss back and forth. Um, how how do we work? How do we develop a design? And how 
can really incorporate uh, and meet these health issues that uh, we can see everywhere in the society and small and big scale. So, yeah, yeah. I think you said it well when it uh, that it added this health oriented layer that it sort of gave you a more natural way and process to approach that than maybe in your in your normal design. But Luciana, you're going to turn to the research. Yes, I want also picking up as well, like in this research practice interaction, we have heard now how the practitioners perceive, but then I wanted to ask the researchers like uh, what uh, lessons have you learned like from working like with Elsie and Martina has this collaboration like uh, uh, help you to shape your perspective on the models or like how to use them so uh, a reflection on that the other side of the yeah absolutely that's an important question because the intention of these models is to be used by practitioners. So we, we, we really need their input to make the models uh, flexible and, and useful. And it has been like extremely rewarding and helped us a lot to clarify and also to develop the models. And uh, for one example, the model for sense of contact, it was originally developed in the context where you have like one central building in a park or a garden. Uh, and now working with the landscape architects in Stavanger, it helped us to develop this model in context where you actually have uh, the green space is the central focus and the building exists in the surrounding area. And uh, it helped us to realize that we need to clarify that in the, in the model that even if the buildings are not inside the project area, still it's very important for the people uh, living there or working there, the view that they have, because we know of the health effects of the view also. It's not about only about using the parks, but also seeing them from outside. And that's just one example. Uh, Anna, you can add here to this. Yes, working close together as we have done in this project, it's really a, an, an opportunity to learn from each other and to follow the project leaders in Stavanger in the projects and having a, a close dialogue with them throughout the design process. It, it really made it possible for us to, to discuss challenges and opportunities along the way as they were using these evidence-based tools in their projects. And this, en this enabled us researchers to get an understanding of the practical use of these tools uh, in each step of the process based on the landscape architect's experience. And, and uh, also having this kind of close dialogue throughout the process enabled us to, to understand better the complex challenges that city planners face when they're trying to apply research-based knowledge in, in city planning. Uh, of course, it helps us to understand um, what more research is needed to integrate the health perspective in city planning and landscape design, but um, uh, and maybe a few um, insights about the tool itself and its use in this context that we gained from following this process where, for instance, that using the tool is described to follow an evidence-based work process in four steps, but designing is not always a straightforward process that you can follow in certain given order. Uh, and every design project is unique in its context. And so it is the design process itself. So in the real world, we can see that the landscape architect will go back and forth between these steps and perhaps start from a different in a different order, depending on the circumstances in each given project. Mm -hmm. And then another important uh, uh, reoccurring aspect in this type of context is the need to use research-based arguments in the process, since designing public spaces is a democratic process, and at least in the Nordic context. Uh, and we can see that being able to put forward relevant research-based arguments to, to support the design process in a political decision process is crucial. So from that perspective, I think uh, they need to be able to, to argument in order to, um, since the design proposals are weighted against so many other important aspects. So I think it's important that we in the 
research community also recognize our responsibility to guide, practi guide practitioners in the process of translating research evidence into design solutions. Thank you, Anna. Anna's both researchers. Very interesting insights, like on this question. I, I want just to turn to Elsie quickly. Like, what should a practitioner think about before using the models? Uh, in a way, nothing. Just uh, use it. Uh, look at it as added value, um, mainly for the project, but for the users as well. Um, for the first time or two, it takes longer time. Or, but as Martina said, the analytical phase is needed and it needs to be thorough to give us in a more depth um, because positive curious ask questions we were lucky to work with Anna and Anna so if you're not that lucky uh, ask your colleagues or find some um, researchers that know it, something about it um, and as Anna said uh, it's correct that switching between phases makes it maybe even more uh, usable, not so straightforward from phase one, two, three, four. So added value, it's a um, positive thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to jump in here. And we had a question in the chat asking about whether actually there were any shortcomings in the models that were presented. So uh, maybe a, a question you to you, Elsa and Anna, um, in, in using them, uh, but also from a research perspective. Are there any challenges and limitations that mm -hmm. practitioners should be aware of? No, um, maybe Martina should ask this question because these 19 qualities, uh, we work with them one by one. We work with them, took them together using two or three at the same time. Mm -hmm. Martina? Yeah, well, um, we work with this uh, process diagram uh, with all the pink clouds, uh, kind of to show that the, the tool only covers some parts of the design process. And I think, um, yeah, we had a lot of uh, back and forth uh, exchange um, uh, to to find out, like, how are we going to show like these technical issues? Can we include it in the other, the analyze of the evidence based design tool uh, that actually uh, some of these technical challenges uh, we have to do separately? We have to show uh, what is regulated in the area, what is the what are the limitations of the project uh, given by uh, the circumstances? And then we can go more into the site and have uh, uh, a more separate part where we go into these um, these questions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I could uh, add here as well, um, because uh, there, it is a step, of course, to, to have this model, read about it, and then to go out to a site and kind of use it. So, I mean, um, it, it's really a challenge, of course. And that's why this kind of project has been so important for us as researchers to see that and to be able to describe the models in an even more flexible way and to, to develop them develop them so that was really the the intention of this project so i think that's a good question and it's what we have been trying to do to uh, clarify things in this project and make the models more useful or more uh, easy to use Thanks, all of you who are posting uh, some questions in the chat. I'm going to turn to a few more of them. Uh, I thought I would start by uh, going to you on the Wasaga. It's a bit of a specific question, but wanting some clarification on the types of health and well-being outcomes and how they can be measured in post-occupancy evaluation. Um, yes, do you think you could say a few words on that? Yes, uh, um, I think really the 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 previous city talk group is the real expert on that so i would recommend you to see that city talk uh, because they have actually done this kind of um uh, research and identifying uh, certain uh, aspects that you would look for in in in, in this kind of service and post evaluations and and also uh, in this project uh, contribute with the with the um, GIS analysis on health statistics in relation to the site 
this video back and wait. So, so um, maybe I would like to, if you want, have to have, if you like to have the specific parameters to to look at, I would recommend you to contact that research yes, group. Yes, and we can so, we can provide the details in the chat. Yeah. Um, mm. And another I, question. Oh, go ahead. Did someone want to jump in, Anna? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in because. Uh, uh, there is really um, good research about schoolyards uh, already existing. So we know that the size of the schoolyard is crucial. And we also know that the variation of the qualities, environmental qualities in the schoolyard are really, really important. So uh, we are kind of using that, um, the already existing evidence. That's what this research is very much about. Uh, but then also it would be really interesting to to come to st phase four with these projects that we have been working with in Stavanger, because it could help us to to follow up now that the 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 landscape architects use the zones and they uh, use the qualities and how are the zones experienced by by the users by the kids and the teachers in the school for instance and by the users in Hamnevika. A recreational area to follow up. How do they experience the zones and how do they experience the qualities? Was, was it the way that we thought it would be? So that would be really interesting. I wish we had all of you to come work on my kids school because it looks very much like the previous picture you showed there. Uh, so I think they could use some of these models and inspiration. But um, we have another question here that is to you, Martin and Elsa, on the on the municipal side. And that's uh, since our green public green spaces need to serve multiple functions, how do you all work to accommodate these various competing needs? Um, how can designers make decisions about what to prioritize? Which one of you wants to jump in? <laughs> well, Tina can begin. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. We always have like a huge um, fight about the square meters. And um, often like functions come first, functions and um, like basic must haves. Uh, and maybe trees are put in the uh, edges and uh, greenery gets smaller and smaller. Uh, when you put in safety zones and uh, everything that you need. Um, so I think uh, this tool is actually quite, in a way, groundbreaking because uh, we get super good arguments to why may maybe the greenery is actually more important than uh, three soccer courses at this uh, area. Like, um, so... Um, I think um, actually uh, many people, the most people understand these issues because they can relate to their own environments, uh, like you, Annika, with your kids. I, I think it's um, it's actually less uh, uh, complicated to argument than one would think. Yes. So far, yeah. And uh, just to add, it's not just landscape architects developing a project. We have a lot of. Um, work across the departments different departments so that we hear everybody and then we yeah of course need to take a conclusion we're almost running out of time for questions but luciana did you have another one that you needed to raise um no i was just uh, I would just follow up in what else is saying i think it's very interesting as well that you work very closely with a healthy strategist right uh, that we have met and she has been part as well of our meetings, project meetings. And I think this is actually like a kind of a working across silo somehow, and this is quite innovative. If you want just to share like a few uh, um, in, in which way your work with uh, the healthy strategist has been improved or like what's your impression? I think it would be a good question too. She has uh, opened our eyes, so to speak. It's um, when the overall strategy is kind of a research um, silo, you might say, and then we're protectionaries. So she has made it more um, useful uh, just to talk and not just read. Um, yeah. And we will take the overall plan and um, make them live uh, when we are doing our projects. Mm. All right. Well, I think we haven't managed to get to all the questions in the chat, but we'll respond to those um, 
afterwards, or if not also, maybe Lisa is already responding to some over here. But I want to let you all know that um, we'll be sharing the presentations and the recordings after this event or later today, next week. Um, and you can also find them on the Nord Regio or Nord Green website. And Luciana has some exciting news. Yes, it's just that I want to inform all of you that uh, soon we will be publishing a handbook that is very target. Our target audience is practitioners. And then this publication will provide as well like further detail on the research of Nord Green that we have like conducted during these four years. And then also delivers like a lot of practical tools, guidelines and frameworks for planning, designing and managing health promoting green spaces. I would also invite the audience to stay up to date like with the Nord Green project. So please sign up for our news newsletter on Nord Egg website or you can also like find the link in the chat. And with this, I would say thanks so much for joining us today. And um, yeah. Yes, and stay tuned uh, for the handbook. I think many questions for more resources and how to use the models, the research is all going to be answered in a way in this handbook. It's uh, in process and it's really exciting. I know everyone here, all these panelists have been working really hard on their chapters. So we look forward to sharing it with you all in the coming months. So a big thank you, Elsa, Anna, Anna, and Martina for joining us and all of you who joined online. Very grateful to have you with us and stay tuned to all the news. Thank yeah. you. Thank have you. a good day.